Good morning, and welcome to the worship service from the Pendleton Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you are here to worship in the sanctuary, and those that are viewing us on YouTube Live, then we welcome you also to our worship service. The announcements are in your bulletin, and I remind you about this coming uh, Tuesday, August the 10th, 6 p.m. The ladies of the church are going to be going around in circles. Let me explain that just a little bit. You're invited to attend that uh, all the circles are meeting in our fellowship hall for the first time in quite a while. Uh, and uh, you are invited to come. Please read the announcement. It's rather lengthy, and I won't uh, read all of that to you. Uh, also, this morning, you have an insert into your bulletin. It is the uh, introit, Come Into God's Presence, and we make copies for each of you. If you would like to sing along with the choir, we would be delighted for you to do so. Let us begin to worship. Please refer to your bulletin for the prayer of confession and let us pray together. God of mercy be above us to judge us and be within us to convict us of our sin. Teach us who worship false gods to fear you, the one true God. Teach us who do not respond to your will to obey the one true God. Teach us who harden our hearts against others to obey you, the one true God. 
Teach all who pursue war its futility and the blessings of shalom. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. God was in Christ who was reconciling the world, satisfying our hunger and thirst for righteousness. All who come to him and humbly confess their sin will be filled with God's mercy and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. seated. <clears throat> you have in your bulletin the prayer of dedication for the offerings that have been received this morning in each vestibule. And so let us use the prayer of dedication to dedicate our gifts. Oh God, you call us to lead a life worthy of our creation. We humbly ask that you receive our gifts. May who we are and what we do be acceptable in thy sight. Through Christ our Redeemer. Amen. And our hymn is number 236. <laughs> Please be seated. 
Our reading this morning from the Old Testament is perhaps the most familiar of all psalms, the 23rd Psalm. Hear the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy right hand, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And now let us come before our Creator God in a moment of prayer, beginning in silence, while you offer the prayers that are in your hearts. Let us pray. And now let us share a moment of prayer together. God of heaven, where angels dwell, we give you thanks for our Christ in whom we glimpse your eternal realm. Through Christ you have poured out your spirit upon all of your children, those who see visions of your splendor and dream dreams of your glory. We praise you that we are numbered among those who can climb Calvary's hill and behold the heavens opening to reveal your majesty. We are grateful for our Lord's mediation as we make our confession. He intercedes for us when our words are beyond wanting and our actions fall short of your will for us. We would claim our righteousness, <clears throat> however greed devours us at times, and we yearn for riches with a consuming desire. So teach us again how you clothe and feed creation and help us to trust in your design for our lives. We would be loving, but hostility we encounter hinders us and we confess we struggle to understand. Help us not to be suspicious of everyone and begrudge them their due as our Lord Christ bore the cross in spite of our sinfulness. Make us more sympathetic to our neighbors who may be innocent and more aware of their burdens. As you raise Christ on the third day and rob death of its victory, raise us to renewed acts of compassion so that sisters and brothers can see what it means to be free. Teach us, our God, what it costs to obey. Send forth your spirit to counsel and guide us as we embark on our faith journey each day. Keep us free from reproach. And we look forward to the day when Christ shall come and pray that we may be found ready. Keep us steadfast as we offer our prayers in our Lord's name and pray together the prayer that he gave unto us by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our reading from the New Testament for this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, and I shall read to you from the 12th chapter regarding the first commandment in our Lord's words. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord your God is one, and you shall obey your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, your mind, and your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all of the understanding and with all of the strength, and to love one another's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him anything. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. If you will pardon me for just one moment, as, a, as with people of a certain age, we have glasses laying all over our house. And I picked up the wrong ones this morning. I thought I could see my notes better with them, but that's not quite true. So if I stumble a little bit, Forgive me. As we think about our world today, what is the, the ingredient that separates us from many nations in the world, even some in our own Western Hemisphere? Our founding fathers believed that all men were created equal. Now, of course, they meant white males. And we understand that this was part of the products of their times and of their lives. Even so, the sentiment of equality has rightly expanded now to include all men and women and children. And my thoughts this week turn to the question, how did they arrive at such a conclusion? Many in our world consider and take human life so casually. And this rouses a question for me about worth. What are our lives worth to us, to each other, to God? Well, for me and most of the Westerners, it comes down to a religious question. It goes back to our concept and our understanding of God, of how God elevate, evaluates the work of his hands, for it was God who singled out human beings as being the most precious of all that he has created. And our Bible makes it clear in the book of Genesis that things were made for humans and not the other way around. Material things of this world that many value above even doing what is right and loving, or what is Christian. Many do not value life over material things. These material things, we are told, are in this world for our fulfillment and not the other way around. This divine ordering of things is the very foundation for our judgment levels and our values. I'm going to share with you an old story. A father wanting to teach his children who were age five and three about how to cooperate and get a job done. And he said, if you will help me wash the car, then I will pay you for it. I'll pay you each 10 cents. Now I told you it was an old story. <laughs> Most kids will turn around and walk away from that today, even five and three-year-olds. They finished, and he reached in his pocket for the change, and he pulled out a dime and a nickel and five pennies. 
and he gave one the dime and the other the five pennies and the nickel. And you can imagine at that age what happened. Soon a cry of injustice rang out. Why was one given only one and the other six? And he thought, how am I going to answer this question? He had to come to grips with that decision that he had made to give them differing amounts of coins. And so he came to the conclusion that I must rely upon what the federal government says they are worth. It is the federal government that says a nickel is worth five pennies, and five pennies are worth a nickel, and a nickel, or I'm getting all confused here, but you get the message. <laughs> You see, when we allow anything else other than God to put a price tag on God's creation, we have the basis for regarding human life as not the highest that it should be evaluated. God, you see, my friends, has made this decision about human life, not us. And the implications are very, very far-reaching. For one thing, it sets before you and me how human society ought to be considered. To assume that we can do this, considering human society, without our religious beliefs, in my view, is very foolish. For whenever human beings make themselves the end of all, eventually human life will become whatever the strongest decide that it will be. And the stage then is set for all kinds of inhumanity and brutality. It has happened, as you know. Perhaps one of the more famous examples of most of our generation. It happened in Germany with the Nazi party and them following the Marxist theory. The rise of this party signaled a break with a basic religious traditions that went all the way back to the Old Testament. In Hitler's Germany, humans were no longer regarded from God's perspective, but judged by what value they had to the party. And what happened when this vantage point shifted? Millions upon millions of people were systematically murdered because of what they were not and because of what they were. When something other than God's evaluation on human worth becomes the primary way of evaluating human beings, what always results is tragedy. Our faith tells us that you and I come from a very specific root system and God is the soil from which we come. And it is the Creator's declaration about what is most important that is the nourishment and the foundation for our civilization. When the soil of God is missing and humans are looked upon only for their loveliness or beauty or usefulness, many will be judged to be unattractive and many will be just as the one who cannot do something for the society. And justification can then be found to do what the Nazis did or the terrorists in New York City today and Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles and Portland and Seattle and wherever else you can name. We must never forget that the love of God is the soil out of which our humanity grows. And when you uproot one, other tragically bad things begin to happen. Only God can say what human life is. And that is our guard against inhumanity. And this is a realization that we must never lose sight of if we are to survive and thrive as God's children. We have to be careful when we look at another person. 
Do we see God in that person? Or do we see some radical or someone we think is not very attractive or very useful for society? If we leave our religious harbor, as did Hitler's Germany and others, you can name them all, you know, Stalin, Idi Amin, etc. And we began treating each other from any other perspective than God's. May God have mercy on us. Leaving God's harbor offers some the permission to crash airplanes into buildings populated by innocent people. It allows people to riot and burn and steal from innocent people innocent businesses without conscience. Our humanness, our civilization, and those things we hold most dear are not things that you and I can create and hold on our own. It is God who has made these things. It is God who has declared them to be what they are. And when God's perspective is lost, there will be no reason to love our neighbors as ourselves, whether in the home, the town, <clears throat> the city, the state, the nation, or the world. And we must recognize that this is the key to our survival when we do not remember or accept God's perspective. Then the specter of man and women's own desires to assign worth becomes a tragedy that we are and have recently experienced. Let us pray. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And now will you please rise and with me say what we believe by repeating together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn is number 310.
from this time that we have shared together, apart from the world, know that there is one who can present you blameless and without fault before the throne of God, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Go in his peace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.